Hello and good morning. This is the Morning History Show for May 27th, 2023. I'm Dr. Sean Munger. I am a PhD historian and I also teach history online, in person, in various places, on author. Today's stories involve a medieval church found under tidal flats in Germany, an Indian gun that the British really want to hang on to, and a really fascinating story about early medieval art treasures from Germany that were looted during and right after World War II. Uh, That story, I put it in the thumbnail, but that one's at the end. A really interesting story, so if you want to uh, hear that one, um, either uh, uh, stay tuned to the end or you can fast forward. So, uh, Well, this podcast launched yesterday, um, and I am probably not going to do a show every single day. That would be just a gigantic amount of work. But I I do want to be active in these early, kind of these early days. Um, I want to build up sort of a back catalog so people who find the show later on can get a sense of what I'm doing here. Also, I need to get a sense of what I'm doing here. Again, a shakedown period for podcast. I've done podcasts before, a second decade. Maybe some of you know me from that. Uh, but I do want to thank every, the, the people who did listen to the first episode. Um, you're in on the ground floor, and I hope you listen to more. So thanks very much. Okay, so the first story in today's show, uh, reported by IFL Science. I hope you know what the IFL stands for. But this is out of Rungholt, Germany. And Rungholt, I had to look it up on Google Maps, it is an island, it's actually two islands, off the coast of northern Germany. And this is right near what I call the chicken neck, that that thin kind of chicken looking thing that connects Germany to Denmark. So Schleswig-Holstein is the German provinces up there. The German mainland coast that is nearest to the Rungholt Islands, it's a bunch of intertidal sand and mud flats. And that's actually important. Uh, for this story. So apparently in the Middle Ages, there was a settlement here uh, in the where the Rungholt Islands now are. And in 1362, there was a huge storm that struck this area and the storm surge totally swamped the settlement. Presumably, I don't know this for sure, but I'm assuming this is what turned Rungholt into a couple of islands. I don't know, but uh, they sometimes call Rungholt the Atlantis of the North Sea. So here's what's in the news. Several outfits of researchers from Kiel University, uh, Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, the Center for Baltic and Scandinavian Archaeology, which sounds like a really interesting outfit to work for, and the State Archaeology Department of Schleswig-Holstein, they've been going out there to survey the tidal flats on Rungholt. And they've been using core samples and ground-penetrating radar and seismic instruments and that sort of thing. And they have begun mapping out the remains of the Rungholt settlement that is apparently trapped under the sand. So this this, uh, town kind of sunk into the the tidal flats of the North Sea and then obviously has been covered by sand. And so now they're identifying what's underneath there. What's interesting, the residents of Rungholt knew that they were at risk, obviously, because among the structures identified are mounds and dikes that were intended to keep the sea out. And obviously, that didn't end up working so well for them. But the biggest discovery here was uh, the researchers found the foundations of a huge building, 130 feet by 50 feet. And it is uh, the probably, almost certainly, the church that was at the center of the town. So the storm that destroyed Rungholt is well documented. This occurred in January 1362, and an account of it appears in the Chronicles of Canterbury, we don't know the name of the person, an English monk who wrote this down, uh, but the, the account uh, goes thusly, quote, Around the hour of vespers on that day, dreadful storms and whirlwinds such as never been seen or heard before occurred in England, causing houses and buildings for the most part to come crashing to the ground, while some others, having had their roofs blown off by the force of the winds, were left in the ruined state, end quote. So this storm struck the whole North Sea area, England, uh, what's now northern Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, all of those those areas. And actually, medievalist.net, really great site. They have some material on the storm of 1362, uh, what they call the Great Wind of 1362, and I'll link that in the description, as well as the main story. 
So pretty interesting stuff. Okay, next story is about British colonialism, which is probably going to end up being a feature on the show. Uh, it, what's in the news, the government of the UK has placed an export bar, that's what they call it, on an antique flintlock gun. I have to be careful not to call it a rifle because it's not a rifle, but an antique flintlock, which was made in 1793 for Tipu Sultan of Mysore. The UK government does not want this object to leave the country and hopes that somebody within Britain is going to buy it and keep it. Instead, they don't say this uh, instead, uh, but it, it, it seems like what they don't want it to do is to let it return to India. So the gun is 14 bore, that's a technical term, and it's elegantly decorated. The photo that I found of it is very small, so I couldn't really see a lot of detail on it, but it is mostly wood. There's a metal barrel and there's inlays, beautifully carved. The wood is carved and colored, very, very lavish. It's, it's a, a, a work of art, really. And this gun was designed in 1793 or 94 by a famous Indian gun maker, Asad Khan Muhammad, for his patron, the Tipu Sultan of Mysore, and it was apparently intended to shoot game. So he went hunting a lot, obviously. And, and this is not out of character. Tipu Sultan had, had a lot of elegant weapons. Some of them were designed by Western craftsmen who uh, made their trade in India. And many of the Sultan's pieces uh, from his collection have been farmed out to museums around the world. For example, there's a blunderbuss in the um, uh, one of the art museums in New York City. Uh, there's a chance, finally got a chance to say blunderbuss. Um, but Tipu Sultan, also known as the Tiger of Mysore, he had a French-trained army. And in the late 18th century, he was a significant figure of resistance as the British were just beginning their process of taking control of India directly from the British East India Company. The way that I teach this in uh, my classes, my middle school classes, I, I talk about like the British didn't come with an army and conquer India and turn it into a colony. That's not how it worked. Like the British East India Company kind of came in and sort of like soaked up India, kind of like a sponge. So I use the sponge analogy. But then there was kind of a pivot point in the 19th, uh, late 18th, early, and especially the 19th century, particularly after the mutiny of 1857, completed the process, but it was... Um, going on before that, where the British government, the British crown, started to take a more direct control of India as a more traditionally held colony. This was after the British East India Company was uh, no longer really viable. But this was during, the Tipu Sultan was, was active during that the early stages of that transitional period. And kind of what's interesting here, after the British lost the American colonies, they sort of maybe as consolation, I don't know, they sort of turned renewed interest to India. And evidence for this, Lord Cornwallis, whom, of course, Washington defeated at Yorktown in 1781, he had a whole second career in India. And he, fact, in fact, fought several battles against Tipu Sultan in the 1790-1792 period. Uh, the Sultan also later found himself in battle against Arthur Wellesley, who's better known as the Duke of Wellington. That was the British general who ultimately defeated Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. So Tipu Sultan was killed in battle in May 1799, and as his sultanate was broken up, the various treasures that he collected were looted by the British. And this particular gun wound up in the hands of the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, which is how it made its way to England. So a member of the Committee on the Export of Works of Art and Objects of Cultural Interest, which is a UK agency uh, that recommended the export bar on the gun, he said, I can't believe he said this, but he said this, quote, Given its aesthetic significance, its impeccable provenance, its scope for further research, and its relevance to both British and Indian history, I hope that this superb fouling piece made for the unfortunate ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan, will be acquired by a British institution where it can be appreciated by all, end quote. Well, I don't know what to say about that. Um, nice of him, I guess, to acknowledge that the fate of the Sultan was unfortunate. But, uh, I mean, this is, this is crazy. 
Uh, the British uh, have traditionally been very reluctant to part with artifacts that they've looted from across the world. Just go to the British Museum and you can see, you know, right there in the main gallery, you know, half of Egypt is there and they won't give it back. While I am not aware of a claimant to the uh, Tipu Sultan's gun, it seems like it more appropriately belongs in India than it does in Britain. Uh, that's just my thought. So, you know, come on, British. Um, you need to do a little better here. Okay, final story is really involved, and I really don't have time to do more than just hit the highlights of it. But this came, what uh, came across my radar screen was a feature story in Der Spiegel, which is an online and print, I guess, uh, I guess it's a print magazine in Germany. Uh, Der Spiegel is a very respected publication. Uh, the story is in English, it's not in German. So I can only give you the basics, but I highly recommend reading the whole thing, and the link to the story is in the description. So this story, I love these these ones because it spans numerous eras. So we're going to do medieval and we're going to do World War II here. The story concerns medieval art treasures, including reliquaries of saints that were stolen by an American serviceman in Germany from the Quedlinburg Cathedral Treasures. Now, Quedlinburg is in Saxony-Anhalt, Germany. Uh, that was a seat for, the time, uh, for a time of the Holy Roman Emperor's such as Otto I, who lived in the late 10th century, and also some other German kings. The kings at Quedlinburg assembled a fabulous treasury of artifacts, many of them associated with saints, you know, hands or fingers or little vials of the blood of saints. This was a big deal in the Middle Ages. People, pilgrims would come to be healed or enlightened by touching the artifacts of the saints, so they were put in these very elaborate jeweled reliquaries. When the Nazis came to power, they started weaving medieval art treasures into their pseudo-historical tapestry about the glory of the German people, and this had to do with the master race and all that crap that they believed in. So Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, got involved with Quedlinburg. He took control of the Quedlinburg treasury in 1938, and then he moved many... At, there, there was something else that was done with Quedlinburg Castle. I believe it was made into some kind of Nazi shrine. So he moved many of the items of the treasury to a bank vault, and then during the war, 65 of the most valuable objects were moved to a complex of caves called the Altenburg Caves in 1942, primarily to shelter them from Allied bombs. Uh, the Germans did, the, did, did a lot of this kind of thing with art treasures. The film Monuments Men is based on this process. Uh, that's the, the premise of that film anyway. So American troops occupied Quedlinburg, beginning in April 1945, and one of these troops, an officer, a man named Joe Tom Midor, collaborated with the troops guarding the caves, and he started smuggling out pieces of the Quedlinburg treasure under his jacket. And he sent these pieces back to his family at their home in White Wright, Texas, and he sent them via military post. Never inspected, apparently. So some of the items he stole included a comb that had once belonged to Henry I, king of East Francia in the early 900s. Now, this is a liturgical comb. It's a, a tool for, uh, in religious ceremonies, it's not, you know, a, a, a hair comb. Uh, there were also reliquaries that he stole, and the most valuable thing that he stole was an illuminated manuscript called the Samuel Evangeliar, written in gold with a jewel-studded cover. And apparently this thing is just beautiful. The uh, Spiegel article does have a picture of it, and it's, it's just amazing. So several of these items were missed in an inventory that was taken in May 1945. And then when U.S. troops pulled out in July of 1945 after the war was over, Quedlinburg fell into the Soviet occupation zone, which of course later became East Germany. And the Soviets were not, and the East Germans were not very motivated to investigate the theft. So fast forward a couple of decades, then in 1988, something called the Quedlinburg Gospel Book, which actually was the jeweled Samuel Evangeliar, that popped up for sale for $8 million. They were going to sell it to a museum in West Germany. And the, the listed owners, the people trying to sell, were Jack and Jan Midor of Texas. They were the a brother and sister of Joe Tom Midor, who had died in 1980. 
so long story short, there was a big court case, numerous investigations of what had happened. And in 1993, there was a lot of, uh, way too much to go into. But in 1993, most of the treasures were returned to Quedlinburg. And there was a settlement with Midor's family. Uh, the IRS apparently got involved in this too. So all parties were were just sort of savagely litigating. And now on the 30th anniversary of the return of the artifacts, that's what the, the occasion is, uh, Der Spiegel has this article about obviously what happened, but emphasizing the loose ends of the case. And there are still some loose ends. So for example, how did Joe Tom Midor know that the treasures were there? And how did he know what to take? The hint in the article is that he must have collaborated with Nazis uh, who had a detailed inventory of what was there. Or possibly the suggestion is that he was smuggling the artifacts to save them from the Nazis or the Soviets. And one of the clues to this, we don't know if it's true, but one of the clues to this is that apparently he did not try to sell the relics. He sent them home uh, and kept them for many, many years. Um, he never married, apparently, and, and had a fascination with these artifacts. It was only his heirs who tried to sell them after his death. So he does not seem to have been interested in looting them for money. So uh, it wasn't, apparently, uh, wasn't really like that. But uh, really interesting, uh, kind of loose ends. Um, there's some others that are mentioned in the Spiegel story. A couple of artifacts on the inventory, in fact, have not yet been located. So uh, where are they? Uh, the Der Spiegel story is very, very extensive. Do read it. And it caught my eye because this actually converges, or at least it's kind of adjacent to some real world experience that I have. A U.S. servicemen in the occupation of Germany after World War II were deeply involved in art theft. And here's where I came in. When I was a lawyer many years ago, I worked on a case that involved uh, stolen art, art, art that had been stolen from Germany during the war. So a serviceman who also happened to be from Texas is not related to the guy in this story, but a different guy. He stole and hid a number of modern art pieces, mainly German expressionist prints, which eventually surfaced in an art museum collection in the 1990s. So these are, these were not medieval treasures, but they were modern art, you know, Otto Dix and Katie Kolwitz and, and kind of the, the German expressionists of particularly between the world wars. So there were all these prints, this collection, which surfaced in an art museum. This was in the 90s, and uh, there were lawsuits filed. And when I was working at a law firm, I got involved working on one of those cases. So what came out in this in this uh, trial that I was involved with, a German people, ordinary German people, used to trade art objects with American servicemen. They used to trade them for food and other things that were very scarce in uh, occupied Germany. In fact, there was a Berlin art market that was dedicated to doing exactly this. So people would go around and find valuable pictures or prints or treasures or whatever, and then take them to the art market and trade them with American servicemen for butter or for milk or, you know, whatever they needed. Uh, and this was a big racket. So this is how a lot of art, uh, both modern and ancient, got out of Germany and far farmed out to various other countries, especially the United States. So this story is not specifically related to uh, Quedlinburg, but it's a similar kind of pattern. So fascinating article. Do read the Spiegel article. It's, uh, it goes into much greater depth. Okay, well, that's what we have today. So thank you very much for listening. Please tell others about this show. Uh, you might want to check out my new blog, which is called The Garden of Memory. That's at gardenofmemory.net. And I may also have a book coming out soon on Kindle short reads. Um, I'll give you more information on that as it comes closer. So I hope you have a great holiday weekend and have a great day. Bye-bye.